So um, I, I just got done teaching a class at the University of Minnesota to honor students. It was called Reality 101. It was uh, nine hours a week for 15 weeks. So that's uh, 135 hours of discussion, which I'm going to summarize the entire semester in about an hour tonight. Um, so I've got a lot of slides. I'm going to go things through things relatively quickly, but I want to um, leave time for questions. So when you give presentations, we're such social creatures that you have some options. I could be funny and feel good and or I could be educational or I could be helpful to your future or our future. And um, given the um, severity of the topics, I'm mostly going to be uh, door number two and door number three in this talk. So when we think about the world, when we, all of us, look at what's happening in the world, we always have a narrative or a lens that we look through. And uh, the typical lenses are political. Ooh, the Republicans or the Democrats or the conservatives or the liberals. And we view the world through those lenses or through geopolitical <laughs> lens. Um, which countries are the bad countries or the poor countries or the rich countries or an economic lens, uh, wages and jobs and growth. Um, but the story I'm going to tell tonight is from an ecological lens. Um, as Bruce said, uh, more of a systems lens and how everything fits together, how humans are part of the, the world environment and the human ecosystem functions in the same way uh, that a biological, ecological organism does. And tonight I'm not going to talk to you as citizens of America or as um, college students who are here to get a, a degree. I'm going to talk to you um, partially as citizens of the planet, which is ecologically full uh, of, of our species, and, and partially as, as young people who most of you live in Hawaii and plan to live here. And what are the opportunities and challenges um, that you're going to face being 19 or 20 years old, facing another you know, 60 years um, on this island, this group of islands? So um, my talk is going to be from three different perspectives. Um, I'm going to talk about the economy and energy and my um, position that growth uh, in the United States and in the developed world is um, ending. I'm going to talk about uh, the environment, a little bit about climate change, but mostly just about uh, the human um, impact on the world. And then I'm going to also talk about um, the most important thing to know when we talk about the human predicament is the human um, itself. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, human behavior. So, and then um, the last half of my talk is going to be a, a, a list of 30 according to Nate, suggestions on how you might take this information into your own lives and, and what to change, what to think about, what to do. Okay, so let's start with the economy. So in nature, everything is run based on trophic cascades of energy. Um, and no matter uh, what level of the trophic pyramid you're at, there is first an energy input. The sun goes to the trees and plants. The plants get eaten by the herbivores. The herbivores get eaten by the carnivores. At every step, there's a heat loss, but energy underpins everything. It's the same thing in human ecology, human ecosystems. We have primary capital uh, at the bottom of the pyramid, which is our trees, our rivers, our forests, our air, and our fossil fuels in this case. Um, we turn that into secondary capital, which is tractors and toasters and refrigerators and houses and computer pointers and services. Here's a Starbucks barista. And then only at the top is there a, um, a, a value marker that is a financial representative of what all the, under, uh, the lower um, parts of the pyramid are. But and a lot of what I'm going to say is totally understood by ecologists, but totally disagreed by economists. Um, so everything in our economies, every single thing that contributes to GDP or gross domestic product requires first and foremost an energy input. No matter how you make a cup, 
whether it's with a coconut or ceramic or glass or tin or steel or clay, you first and always need an energy input. Energy is a precursor to everything that we do. Now, um, this is uh, me. I'm about a tenth of a horse. That's my horse, which would be one horse. Um, that's my utility vehicle, which is the work of 45 horsepower. And that's my truck, which is 150 horsepower. If you consider my water bottle here full of diesel, um, will power that truck about seven or eight miles uphill in the snow. And can you imagine how many people it would take to do that amount of work? And we just take it for granted because gas is $2.50 or whatever. It's stored sunlight that we are the beneficiaries of. So everything in this graph costs $50. Actually, as of today, oil costs $32. Um, but economists treat everything on this graph the same. A barrel of oil is worth some sunglasses or a bottle of tequila or a clicker mouse or anything else worth $35. And yet, um, every single thing in our economies is dependent on an energy input. The reason it's only valued at $35, we're going to get into in a little bit, but we're just paying for the extraction of it. It took millions and hundreds of millions of years for it to be formed. So we, each American right now, has 60 barrel of oil equivalents of fossil energy standing behind us, unseen, uncomplaining. Um, we're starting to know that these fossil slaves poop and breathe based on some of the environmental constraints, but we, each of us, have 60 barrel of oil equivalents every year of coal, oil, and natural gas, which um, explains our wages, explains our profits, explains our low price stuff, and to a great extent, explains the moonshot in human population over the last couple hundred years. Um, so a lot of you have seen this graph, um, that uh, 10,000 years BC, we were at about a million people. Now we're at 7.3 billion people. But what a lot of people don't know is this is the GDP or wealth kind of per capita since 1,000 BC. Not only has human population gone up, uh, you know, sevenfold in the last couple hundred years, but our wealth also has, and this is expressly due to our mining of stored um, pixie dust in, in fossil sunlight. I, I would point out that this graph was from the head of the um, UK, the Britain's central bank had a 40 page speech on growth and not once in 40 pages was the word energy um, stated. So if we think about all the billions of people on the planet and the work that they do every day, 90% of the labor done in our economies is not done by humans, it's done by fossil fuels. And um, so what ends up happening is the key story of industrialization was um, adding large amounts of cheap energy to replace activities humans used to do. So back to that barrel of oil. One barrel of oil has 5.7 million BTUs in it of energy. That translates into 1,700 kilowatt hours of work. So Richard Ha farming bananas or working hard on his farm or me shoveling snow or doing chores back in Minnesota can generate around six tenths of one kilowatt hour in one day. So for me to generate the same amount of energy potential that's in one barrel of oil, which now costs $35 to us, would take 11 years. So think about that. And we use 60 barrels each for every American. We have smorgasbord kings and queens of old lifestyle at our disposal that we take for granted. We never think about this work benefit that we're getting. So here's, here's uh, uh, um, numerically demonstrating that. So to do one hour of labor, uh, to generate one kilowatt hour of work by a human, um, American, it costs $260. The average American uh, person in the world is $57 to do one kilowatt hour of work. And yet, at $75 barrel, it's four cents. 
Right now we're half of that, so it would cost us two cents to do the same amount of work that would cost a plumber or a factory worker $260. And this is not in the economic textbooks because they treat energy as fungible. If we get high enough prices, we'll create more energy. And we can't create energy, we can only extract it faster. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so how does this work? So where I live, there's a lot of dairy farms. Um, so what we are doing is we're adding a huge amount of mechanical energy to replace the tasks that humans used to do themselves. So imagine if you're manually milking a cow, it only, it takes 30 minutes for one human to milk one cow. And the math of that works out that you make $3 an hour. But then in the middle example, we have these semi-automatic milking machines, which is a lot of embedded energy and then a lot of kilowatt hours of electricity. And you end up reducing the human time in half to 15 minutes a cow, but you're adding 300 kilowatt hours of energy and your wage goes up to $5. And then there's a fully automatic uh, milking machines where you do virtually no work. The, the, the machine grabs the cow, milks it and kicks it off. And that it reduces human time from 30 minutes down to three minutes. But it adds a lot more energy, 400 times more. But the wages per hour end up being $15 an hour. Or the milk is cheaper to the consumers. Or the factory owner has a higher profits. Or any combination of that. So by adding huge amounts of very, very cheap energy, like 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 units of fossil energy to replace what humans used to do explains a lot of our wealth and our society. So here's a graphic. On the bottom is um, how much mechanical energy you're adding, and here is the wages. And you can see the red line at five cents a kilowatt hour. As you add more and more fossil slaves, the wages per hour go up and up and up. But what happens if you triple the hourly wage of electricity? Then it goes up and up only to a middle amount, to the medium energy uh, intensive industries. And then after that, the really energy intensive industries, the, the benefits to humans decline. Um, here's, here's another example that shows 5 cent, 10 cent, 15, 20 cent, and where the um, drop off happens. The message here is we use a lot of units of this fossil energy, and the more energy intensive something is, the more susceptible it is to um, energy price increases. Okay, so I did my PhD on something called net energy, which is measuring the energy costs of something, not in dollar terms, but in energy terms. And this is from ecology. Because cheetahs, who expend very little energy to get a big energy-dense antelope, are going to have advantages for cellular metabolism, cellular maintenance, mating, reproduction, food for their offsprings, etc. So if all of a sudden a cheetah had to chase some other prey, not as good as a, a, an antelope, but maybe a rabbit, he might be very successful in chasing the rabbit, but the rabbit wouldn't have a good energy payoff. Or maybe you had to chase a mice, a mouse. Um, so the energy payoff, the energy input versus the energy output in nature is very central. And it's also central in human economies. So in the 1930s, we had oil that was just bubbling from right under the surface. And then in the 1970s, we started to drill under the ocean because the easy to find stuff was gone. And now we're doing uh, tar sands, and they're starting to drill in the Arctic, and they're doing this complicated horizontal fracturing that requires $70 or $80 oil prices just to break even. So we found the good stuff, and now we're going after the harder stuff, just like a cheetah is you know, moving from gazelles to some other prey. So the energy return on investment for oil on discovering oil used to be over 1,000 to 1 and has now declined into the single digits. Oil discovery, you have to discover oil before you consume it or produce it, peaked in 1964. Ever since 1964, we've found less and less oil every year, even though we've been producing more because we've or produced what we found a long time ago. So um, some of this gets a little complicated, just trying to get the, the general points. 
So um, this graph shows Saudi Arabia that they need an oil price, a market price above $100 in order to plug their budget deficits. So right now, oil has crashed from over $100 to $32 today. And you might think that's good news because Hawaii is a very oil dependent pl place, not only for your electricity, but for all the tourism industry and everything else. I would argue it's a very bad sign because it's going to put people to sleep that there's not an oil problem in, in the f near and, and medium term future. But the issue now is that the market price, well, I'm going to get to that in a second, but the, the point of this graph is most conventional oil producers need a hundred dollar barrel. Um, to balance their fiscal budgets, and unconventional producers need a $100 barrel to make a profit. So there's a critical distinction between price and cost. When we talk about oil, most of you probably are like, oh yeah, I went to the uh, gas station and it was $2.50, what's to worry about? The price of oil is what we pay. The cost of oil is what the energy companies pay. And the energy companies' cost has been going up and up. So oil today at $35 is around the same as it was in 2003 and 4. And yet the oil cost to the Exxons, the Mobiles, the Saudi Aramcos of the world, on average has gone up 17% annually at cost. So the average barrel of oil right now in the world costs around $60 or $70 to break even. That's the break even. So we talk about peak oil, which is when the world hits a maximum and then starts to decline. I think that's a misnomer. It was a, it was a poorly chosen concept. The real story is peak benefits, which is as we e extract the higher and higher cost oil, there's plenty of oil in the world, but the hydrocarbon molecules under the ground aren't the whole story. It's how much society has to pay to get it out and then the benefits we get after it's distributed. And poverty is a big part of that, which I'm going to get to a little later. I better speed up too because I think I'm going a little slow. So this is the U.S. oil production. We peaked in 1970. Um, the red is the lower 48. The um, light uh, beige is um, Alaska. The blue is offshore. And, and the green has been skyrocketing the last few years. It's the tight oil, which is pretty much near source rock, the, the bottom of the barrel. And it's um, um, been increasing until the last few months it's been declining. But that's the really expensive oil. Okay, so um, if we look at um, growth in the world, growth in the world is incredibly tied to how much primary energy we burn. Human society functions kind of like a heat engine. And um, when we have cheap energy, it grows, and when we have expensive energy, um, it declines. And a lot of people say, yeah, well, technology is going to solve it. Um, technology is a very interesting thing. Most technology, there's four, four types of technology, basically. The first type is doing things with energy um, and technology that humans used to do themselves, like chopping down trees. Now we use a chainsaw. Um, or driving a car, we used to walk. Uh, another thing is there's new resource conversions, like new gadgets that we come up with, Facebook and Twitter and Xbox, things that humans never did before, but now we have an outlet for. And then there's also resource energy efficiency, like a power plant might use a lump of coal and get more heat out of it than it originally did with better technology, or new energy technology like geothermal on, on, on this island and solar panels and things like that. But these two um, technologies dominate the story and technology ends up being a vector for more energy use. And so we're building this larger and larger global human heat engine. Uh, real quickly, this is a chart of global energy consumption over the last 200 years. The bottom beige is trees, biomass. Um, where I studied in Vermont in the 1850s and 60s, there were hardly any trees except on the mountains because it was clear cut. People cut all the trees down for fuel, fuel and food. Um, except the energy return from climbing up on a mountain to bring a tree back down was prohibitive. So those were left alone. And then the um, gray is coal, the green is oil, um, the red is natural gas, this light blue is nuclear, this is hydro, and this little sliver on the top is, is non-hydro renewables. Okay, we can't really understand energy if we don't understand money. 
Energy is what makes human society go around, but money is what people think makes it go around. So money, if we understand the energy underpinnings of society, money is just a claim on future energy. If you cash your check today, you can go right out and buy some pizza or go to a movie and you immediately have a call on energy. Or you can put it in the bank and spend it in 20 years, but whatever you spend it on 20 years from now is going to require some energy. So the economic textbooks are wrong about where money comes from. Money, 95% of our money is created from thin air by commercial banks with absolutely no tether to natural resources. If you're a credit worthy customer and the bank is in good shape, you all of a sudden have a million dollars in your account to start your business. And what happens is then there's a million dollars IOU asset on the bank's ledger. And the whole world is, is neutral, except what happened. Nowhere, anywhere in the system did a million dollars of purchasing power leave. There was magically a million dollars new came into the system, but not the interest on it. So the system has to grow in order to pay the interest back on the money that was created. This was never a problem when we had an empty country full of natural resources and lots of great ideas and lots of ambition and lots of energy. But now it's starting to be a problem. So this is the last, um, this slide is about six months old, but our world GDP in 2000 was 41 trillion, and last year it was 57 trillion, increase of 16 trillion. Our world debt went from 87 trillion to 200 trillion over the same time, an increase of 112 trillion. So we're adding debt just to keep things kind of growing just a little bit. And once we add so much debt that we're adding a billion dollars of debt just to keep GDP flat, then we're in a situation where we're transmuting wealth into income. We're not there yet, but we are adding more and more debt to paper over some of these problems. And what happened is China added too much. They had too much credit to get their economy going. And now they kind of like run out of gas. And that's what's happening right now is we're at the beginning of kind of a deflationary depression. So if you think about it, um, money is a marker for real capital and energy is our real capital. And at some point there's an inflection where um, money doesn't accurately represent the energy and ability to pay it back in the future. Okay, so this is kind of a complicated but important graph. Um, this is a oil price for the last 15 years and this is uh, pretty much today, roughly, well, right somewhere in here. So we created too much money that people couldn't generate returns on it and now all commodities in the world are, are coming down. And what's going to happen then when oil is at $30, all the oil companies that had 70 or 80 or $100 um, costs are going to go out of business. And what happens if a lot of oil companies go out of business? Well, then when demand goes up again, there's not going to be as much oil. So what's going to happen is this accordion where we have a boom and bust in the oil industry. And I would argue that the, the time between these crises becomes shorter and shorter. And we will have significantly higher energy prices, multiples, multiples of what you're used to in your lifetimes, probably sooner than, well, I can't say sooner than your lifetime. That would be silly, but within the next 10 years or within the next five years. Um, what's happening now in the energy sector is, is not good news because a lot of people um, are conflating the difference between money and, and energy. Okay, so let's talk about the environment. Um, some of you are environmental students. So the economy is obviously a subset of the environment, but in our economics texts and in our businesses, we treat air and healthy ecosystems as external from our economy. They're externalities. We don't have to pay for them. Um, so we are, humans are, um, using between 25 and 40 percent of the net primary productivity on the planet. One species out of 10 million is using almost 40 percent of the direct sunlight that's appropriated by biomass for our own um, entities. Um, so We thought, we, we, we looked at the heat engine uh, of more and more primary energy use 
And this it can be uh, witnessed by a lot of things that in the last 60 years called the Great Acceleration. Lots of uh, environmental things you're aware of. Um, you know, there's just hockey sticks left and right on human impact. So a lot of you have probably read about the climate forecasts. Um, I'll briefly talk about that here. I think after I die, I don't care if one year after I die or 10,000 years after I die are equivalent. I think a lot of people are worried about climate change the next 20 or 50 years. I'm worried about what we're doing for the next 100,000, especially to the oceans. The good news is, is that I think a lot of these, um, these estimates are these climate experts have these estimates. They're based on econometrics models that extremely exaggerate the affordability of fossil fuels that are in the ground. They just assume we will um, use three or four or five times as much as, as I think are extractable. But that's a debatable point. But when we look at this um, graph, what we often don't hear is what I'm about to tell you. And if this is the first time you've heard this, I apologize because it's a little hard hitting. Um, so this is an estimate of before the agricultural revolution. The black dot is the weight of humans. There was one million of us alive. This was the estimated weight of all the wild animals, the terrestrial vertebrates. This is today. So that was then, this is today. Today, humans are 425 million tons. Wild animals are 30 million tons. <coughs> and human um, livestock for our food is 14, a, a billion 450 million tons. What does that mean? That means that humans and our cows, pigs, goats, and dogs outweigh wild animals 60 to 1. That's pretty freaking intense um, and disturbing. So here's uh, presented in a different way. And the two main points are, if you consider 10,000 BC versus today, the total biomass of all terrestrial vertebrates, including us and our food supply, is around four or five times what it was then. Why? Because we're tapping ancient sunlight. So the whole mass of the system is bigger. And then the second is that humans, I mean, this is, this is 1900. So from 1900 to now, we've exploded in our impact. This is the last white rhino, and they're having to hire 24-7 armed guards. So we are, irrespective of what you think about energy and the economy or climate change, we are witnessing and responsible for the sixth great extinction. Species are going extinct thousands of times faster than the background rate. And, um, you know, 90% of pelagic fishes like tuna are gone. 98% of whales are gone versus a couple hundred years ago. Sea turtles, 98%. I mean, it's, it's really, it's, it's so depressing that you can't even really think about it. But someone has to. Um, Okay, so putting this part together, humans have uh, an ecosystem, a trophic pyramid. They used to use sun and soil and trees and plows and tools and create some art and some like bread and ale. Um, and we were like largely an uh, agricultural uh, species. You always read that in like the science fiction books like The Hobbit and it always sounds so good when they write about it with bread and ale. Um, but now we've turned into a, a more advanced system where at the top we don't have value, we have surplus, we, we, we don't have surplus, we have surplus value. We're measuring things not in surplus, we're measuring things in what it's worth. And our pyramid is kind of lopsided because we've used half to two thirds of the good natural capital. And we've created a lot of uh, secondary capital, but actually now in America, our service industry is larger than our manufacturing industry. As of last year, there are more bartenders and waitresses than there are manufacturing jobs for the first time in history. And we've got this very distorted financial um, uh, accounting of all this. Okay, so um, real quickly out here, 
The um, average wage over the last 150 years, um, median wage is the gray line, and productivity is the black line. Well, how can this happen? Well, a lot of the wages and profits went towards the business owners and the top of the pyramid, and the average person has not really seen a large increase in the last 30 or 40 years. I'm gonna skip that. So in America, only the top 5% of families are doing better than they were 10 years ago. 95% are the same or less as far as their salaries versus the cost of goods. So even in America and in Hawaii, um, there is a, a, an end to growth. And growth is like a word like love or hope that we just throw around as if it were a, a natural thing, but it's an ecological thing. It's based on ecology and systems. I'm going to skip that due to time. So there is um, all of the, all of the, um, it's kind of warm in here, isn't it? Or is that just Hawaii? Or is it because I'm talking? It's quite, it's, or it's because I wear a sweater. That was smart. <laughs> um, so there's not a single policy or government agency in the world that forecasts flat or negative growth. If we have a recession or a depression, they just forecast their 3% or 2% growth into the future after the, after the recession, which is what this graph is. They don't understand the difference between gross and net energy, and neither do you because I didn't talk about it, so I'm gonna skip that slide. Um, but the, the, the main forecasts for this century are that by 2068, the United States will be as big as the whole world is today. That's like legitimate forecast by economists, that the size of the US economy will be as big as the world economy. So this is the, this is the OECD long-term forecast of growth for all these countries, and here we are today. And where's the energy gonna come to do that? This is absolute fantasy. Now, how is this gonna manifest? It's gonna manifest first, not with hard limits to growth, but with social limits to growth. And you're gonna have rising poverty. Already in America, 50% of Americans, if they lost their job, they have three months or less of savings. There's a lot of rich people, but there's a heck of a lot of poor people, and there's starting to be more people. And Hawaii has one of the highest homelessness and poverty rates in, in the nation. Um, so as energy gets more expensive, one of the casualties will be poverty, and the other one will be the really energy-intensive industries, uh, like um, cement or aluminum or air, aircraft are, are very energy-intensive. Okay, what are some things that would reduce climate risk and save environment species? Well, a steep carbon tax would, steep consumption tax, or a baby tax. What are some things that would help the economy? Cheaper energy, 50,000 forgivable government loan for every American, industrialized Africa and Asian subcontinents. In your lifetime, you're going to witness the epic battle of our day akin to the Inquis Inquisition and the Crusades, which is the battle between economic growth and environmental protection. It's already happening now, um, and I would urge you all to take, uh, take part in that. So, what about politicians? Well, they're a little bit um, ineffective at this problem, because you can imagine. I want to be reelected, more social status access for me. I have no answers to the real questions. I don't even want to acknowledge the problems at hand. I don't want to admit I have no idea. I will do what I can to keep me in power. So it's, it's kind of who is going to, who would vote for me if I was saying the things that I'm saying tonight, even though they can be scientifically connected, maybe not the synthesis, but each one of these things can be looked at. It's not a popular thing until things get really bad. And then, of course, but the reason that all, look at Donald Trump, scary. But it's nothing really about him. It's about the 20 or 25% of Americans that like what he says. It's not about him. And we are creating conditions where someone like that could get elected. He's down to four to one, by the way. So there's people that think, anyways, I got, I got a lot more to talk about. So let me get going. Renewables, mature, cheaper, very good things, but not to keep this economy going, not to keep business as usual going. The red line is some hypothetical price. 
Fossil fuels are getting more costly, renewables are getting cheaper, but in my opinion, no combination of fossil fuels and renewables can continue economic growth. So real quickly, oh, I just said that, no combination of fossil and renewable energy will maintain economic growth. Fossil carbon underpins all of our mining, extraction, industrial processes needed for renewables. Think diesel fuel. A third or more of societal energy uses would have to be ceased even if we, if we were to dedicate enough energy. Because to invest in renewable energy, we need to take energy away from some other part of the economy and invest it in those plants and such. Currently, scaling renewable energy is not replacing fossil fuels, but building a larger heat engine. We're not actually replacing it and then stopping the coal and gas. We're, we're using all. We're using more. 80% uh, or so of the energy in the United States is non-electric, and most renewables are electric. So liquid fuels, oil, is going, is, is going to be the real story. Now, renewable energy are the right answer, but to a, a different question. We can have a vibrant and meaningful society using mostly renewable energy. Rough guess would be a quarter to a third of the current footprint. We'll have to work when the wind blows and sun shines and not bake two turkeys at 3 a.m. if we have a craving to, etc. We're gonna have to be more intermittent. And I'm not talking the next five years, I'm talking the next 50 years during your lives. We'll need to keep fossil carbon industry going to maintain high quality liquid fuels or turn the roughly $100 trillion of built machines into electric. And this is not gonna be affordable to the average person. All this stuff is technically feasible, but if we get back to my point on, on the benefits that we get from this cheap fuel, at $200 oil, a lot of the benefits that we get right now would, would go away. Um, this is just kind of a rhetorical question. Can financial markets or democracy work with contracting economies? Um, okay, so um, summary so far. We do not face an energy shortage, but rather a longage of expectations. For most, not all people, growth is already over and the same or less will be the new reality. Current high consumption levels are being supported by central banks creating money and guarantees around the world. I didn't really talk about that. A carbon tax is a tax on 90% of our workers and would therefore reduce GDP. Solar and wind are getting cheaper, but not cheap enough to continue growth. And without growth, we have poverty and greater inequality. We need larger than baby steps, but our policies and institutions were designed for only baby steps. We're unlikely to do much in advance of a crisis. The main difference between us and earlier humans is two things. One, we're using fossil sunlight, and two, we figured all this stuff out. I have a lot more to say though, so hang with me here. In order to know about the human predicament, we have to know about the human. And not to pick on Richard, so um, I have a picture of me too. I am delusional. I think we are all delusional, which means that our difference between our virtual worlds and our mind, the thing that we think we see in the world, is different than the physical world, actually. Now, with education and training, you can narrow that difference. But as a species, we are inherently delusional. Let me talk a little bit about that. We are related to all life on Earth. Four and a half billion years uh, of evolution, and we are 99.999% genetically related to everyone in this room, no matter what our ancestry is. 99% plus or minus related to uh, pygmy chimps and, and bonobos and 90% related to a cow, 80% related to a cat, 70% to a fruit fly, 50% to a banana, etc. We have common genetic heritage to everything on Earth. And um, we are the last surviving hominid um, that made it through the ev evolutionary gauntlet. Um, we split off from the other great apes five or six million years ago. In Europe, this is like old hat, but when I speak in America, people are like totally shocked when I say this stuff, or pissed off, either shocked or pissed off, or both. Um, but behavior is best understood through the lens of evolution. Our brains, all animal brains, um, started with the reptilian, like deep core system built on top of that, the emotional limbic system built on top of that, up and forward as we evolved. And our species is anatomically modern at around 200,000 years ago. So even before then um, and after then, we had thousands and thousands of generations where everything was kind of stable and we lived uh, amid scarcity. And that has a huge carryover impact to our behavior today. 
So if you believe that we evolved, and you imagine and read the anthropological evidence that there were tribes of between 25 and 150 humans, you can imagine what sort of things would have been adapted, what sort of things would have led to success in, in food acquisition, what sort of things would have been status and, and led to mating and survival. And those things end up being adaptations that all of us have to some extent. And the problem is, is that the emergencies like peak oil and climate change and biodiversity loss, we can conceptualize those things, but they don't shout loudly. They don't give us the neuroendocrine cascade or the neurotransmitter feelings that a cheeseburger or an email from a cute guy in our science class or uh, some beer or a fast car, those things shout loudly to us because they're telling us that these things are good for your fitness. These things are good for your relative status. And they're tricking us, but that's what I call the agenda of the gene. Um, and the agenda of the gene basically is a downhill roll towards things that feel good. So some of those things, um, and I spent five weeks on this in my class, so I'm going to do 10 minutes of it here. Um, we care about social status. We are an amazingly social species. We're an ultra social species. We care about relative more than we care about absolute. So we really, really want to see what those other people just bought in their new garage or a new car or so, and, you know, things like that. So I'm sure even at your young age, you know, you compete with the other men or the other girls, you know, with some purse or some football or I don't know what, but it, you're, you're, you're doing it. Um, okay, so we have an extremely long list of cognitive biases. So cognitive dissonance, some of you have probably heard about this. This is an example from Jared Diamond's book, Collapse where there was a bridge, a dam that was about to collapse. And people that were five miles up uh, downstream were mildly concerned. People that lived two miles away from the dam, they were pretty worried because it meant their house would be damaged. But people that lived within one mile of the, of the dam professed total non-concern. I'm not really worried about it. It's probably not a big risk. They were so psychologically worried that their adaptive biases made it seem like it was not a worry because that made them more functional in their day-to-day -day lives. It's called cognitive dissonance. So I'm, I'm beginning to tell you some of the reasons that society is not addressing some of the issues I talked about before. So uh, we know that climate change is real. We know that we are emitting carbon into the atmosphere 10 million times faster than it was formed. We know that that has long-term consequences for our planet. We know that Hawaii is in the middle of an ocean. And hey, let's get some beer and pizza. Holy crap, Godzilla's in Honolulu. So the way that our brains work is something called time bias, is we don't pay attention to stuff until it's right in our face. We can think about it, we can conceptualize it, but it's so far away that until it actually happens, we don't react. And in economics, it's called the discount rate. In psychology, it's called impulsivity. I just call it time bias. James Schlesinger, head of the CIA in the 70s, said, we only have two modes, Americans do, complacency and panic. And right around the time he said that, Johnny Carson joked on The Tonight Show that America ran out of toilet paper. And by 10 AM the next morning, we did, in fact, run out of toilet paper because everyone rushed to the stores and bought all the toilet paper that they could. So confirmation bias is when we already believe in something and we only seek out information that confirms what we already believe. Uh, In-group conformity bias. Um, there was a person sat in a room with seven other people and if the other people said, oh, line B is the most like this line, two thirds of people agreed that line B was the same as this line. We we're very, very peer uh, oriented. Optimism bias. 90% of college professors think they're better than average. 99.9% .9 of high school admitted said they were better than average at other people getting along with them. When we are adaptive, when we are optimistic, it reduces cortisol, which is a stress hormone, and it boosts helper T cells, which help our immune system. So to be happy and look on the positive side of life helps us physically. So there's no wonder why we do it. Um, Here's another problem, which isn't like an official bias, but intelligent people all think the same way. That is a problem. Uh, you might call it groupthink. This is a 
the uh, uh, central bankers and Federal Reserve people from all over the world a few months ago. <laughs> um, authority bias. It's been shown that someone that's charismatic and confident, even if they have a terrible track record, is more believable than someone who's mild and meek and not that uh, charismatic, even though their track record is really good. Like we respond to um, that sort of, of, of speaking. And here's a few more biases. There are actually thousands of biases. We are not a rational species. So again, the virtual world, what we have in our brains, shouts louder, makes more sense to us as it should. It's what we get our enjoyment of life from than the physical world. But we humans are facing some physical world problems now. So um, there's a spectrum between 100% BS and 100% true physical world. We humans, even our best scientists, cannot see this. Science gets us close. A synthesis, as Bruce pointed out, um, gets us potentially even closer. And you know, the problem right now is every bus driver and golf caddy has an opinion on ocean acidification. Um, maybe not that, but on climate change or whatever. Everyone has opinion on everything. And they're not qualified to. Um, and this is, I don't know the answer to this, I'm just pointing it out. Okay, so now I'm getting into the what to do uh, part about these problems. Um, what do we do? What should you do? Um, well, first of all, how do you even think about these things? Because when you say, what do you do, what does that mean? What do I do? What do I do for Hilo? What do I do for the Big Island? What do I do for America? What do I do for the world? What do I do for future generations? And you know, everyone's gonna be different. The agenda of the gene is gonna be this, which is what do I do for me and my immediately family? And there's gonna be some weirdos out there that care very little about themselves and their family, but they care about other species and other generations. Um, I'm someone in the middle, but I know some people like this and they inspire me to be a better person. So I call this the agenda of the self-aware mind or the agenda of the sapient mind. Um, so what do we do? Okay, so as I said before, we're facing a battle between this continuing to get these neurotransmitters, dopamine, that give us these feelings that our ancestors got, but these feelings have huge environmental impacts. Most people care about dolphins and the oceans and elephants and tigers and the ecosystems of Hawaii. They just don't know exactly how to implement that care given an economic system that only cares about more. So what I'm gonna talk about now is these same three things. I'm gonna give some advice on each of these. And in order to engage here, the first thing that I think needs to happen is we need people on the game board. So the first thing is to care about the future or, or at least be educated about it. Okay, so let's go through these. We'll start with how do you respond what do you do facing an economy that's at best gonna be this and at worst is gonna be declining? I used to make $500,000 a year when I was on Wall Street. I managed billionaires' money. I spent it all. Every year I spent almost all of it. Um, didn't have much savings. I had large parties like this, almost like Wolf of Wall Street, but I didn't do drugs. But I, I saw a lot of people do drugs. Um, and. Uh, now I make $50,000 a year. I teach at the University of Minnesota. I do a little bit of consulting. I have no savings left to speak of. I've never been happier in my life because I'm surrounded by people who are studying and engaged in what really matters and not in these little cubicles with guys trying to make money off of other, other money. And I just found that so meaningless and shallow on a short human existence. But there's some science to back this up. This is a graph I did that primary energy use per capita as we go here and percent very happy. This is a large uh, um, social values study. And it suggested that the United States uses twice the energy as the Netherlands and 38 times the energy as the Philippines, yet the percent of the population that was very happy was about the same. And that's because we look around us and the people around us are what we measure our success and happiness again. It's, it's like this, this treadmill. And sociological studies have shown that if you're very poor and destitute, that increases in resources and money give you huge gains in happiness and well-being. But once you level off here, and in America this level is around $60,000 a year, 
more money does not make you much more happy. And I can tell you from managing billionaires' portfolios that some of those guys were freaking miserable. Um, and even they were made another billion and they were even more miserable. That's just personal anecdote. So I will say that finance is what we strive for. This species at this time on this planet, we want more money. It hasn't always been that way. Money is a financial marker for real capital. Real capital is natural capital. That's my backyard, healthy soil, um, healthy river, trees. Social capital is our friends, our networks. In this case, it's two of my dogs. Built capital, this is my house. It's built with real things. There's solar hot water, there's um, chainsaws, an aloe vera plant, a barbecue, that's built capital. And then there's human capital, which is our health, our skills, our knowledge. So finance, that's me and that's my dad with some vegetables. Finance is, is a marker for all this other stuff. So my recommendation, number one, is redefine what wealth means to you. And I have this silly little acronym, go from less to enough. And less means try to reduce energy, stuff, and stimulation, and go towards enough, which is ecology, nature, utility, friends, and family. Okay, so neuroscience studies, when you have dopamine, which is this reward neurotransmitter, it feels really good, like when you win a lottery or you get praise from a colleague or whatever. What happens when in the brain though, is you get a signal that something is coming and then you do some action. And during that time is when the dopamine is firing in your brain. But when you get the reward, it no longer fires. And I don't have time to really get into this, but the implication is, is that the act of buying something is when you get the brain feeling like this is awesome. And then you buy that thing, like some new shoes, or something like that, and you very quickly are no longer happy about it and you need to buy something else to get that same feeling. And this is the, 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 the trick of, okay, so here's the thing. I used to be on Wall Street and I made a lot of money now. I wish I had some of that money now, but one of the ways I get my dopamine is I go find agates, which are these billion-year-old rocks. But I find them and they're so beautiful and I love them but then I throw them in this bucket in my garage and I've got buckets and buckets of agates. I've never even looked through them once. So it's the finding of them that I really love. It's the having of them that doesn't mean anything to me. Even though if someone stole them, I'd be pissed off. But, um, but I'm trying to illustrate a point. And the point is that one more shopping center, one more rainforest chopped down, one more giant skyscraper, one more... Uh, orgasm, one more giant building, and then it resets. The next day we need new brain chemicals to make us feel that way. The problem is, is our brains are flow-based and we live on a stock-based world. And so this is one of the central problems we face is how to get these neurotransmitter feelings. Um, so I would argue that as individuals, you should try to stop at enough instead of going over the deep end. So. Uh, my number two recommendation is recognize and resist meaningless consumption. I'm going to go longer than I originally thought, but I don't think you're going to be bored in the last, I, I'll be done in like 12 minutes uh, or so. Um, this is not my storage unit, but it just as well could be. All the stuff that I bought the last 15 years, I think is really important. I've not opened my storage unit in three years. So as young people, just, you know, think that through. Don't just stand there, be useful. I think. College degree is important, but have skills outside of that. Uh, you, know, you remember the TV show MacGyver that could do all kinds of stuff. Maybe be a good cook. Maybe learn small engine repair. Have some skills. You don't need a lot. You don't need to know everything, but if you know something, that'll be helpful. Is bigger better? Um, you know, this gets back to the relative versus absolute thing. Real quickly, would you prefer to own a 4,000 square foot house in Hilo where all your neighborhood Houses were 6,000 square feet? Or would you prefer a 3,000 square foot house, a much smaller house, but when all your neighbor's houses were 2,000 square feet? Most people would prefer the, the smaller house as long as it was bigger than their neighbors. So recognize this quirk in our brain about competing with other people. And the problem is, um, you know, my recommendation is enjoy absolute rather than relative wealth. We are all absolutely phenomenally wealthy to be alive at this time, to be in Hawaii at this time with jets flying and 
sushi and cool drinks and I mean it's insanely amazing to be alive right now and the problem is is when you finally do run and keep catch up with Joneses you might find out that he's totally miserable all right um, number five become more flexible and adaptable energy is going to get much much more expensive in your lifetimes don't get sucked into a lifestyle that requires a huge amount of energy or a huge cost of things be more flexible Localize and regionalize supply chains. Okay, I gave this talk to my students a month ago, and I live in Minnesota, um, but you live in Hawaii. So this has very profound implications for Hawaii, and I could give a whole hour talk just on this. But where do you localize and regionalize your supply chains in Hawaii? I will make a prediction, and you might not want to hear this. In five years, most everyone is going to understand that everything that I've just told you except for the human behavior part. They'll never probably understand that. But the energy and the money stuff is gonna become more commonly known. What's gonna happen? There's gonna be a lot of people that are gonna leave Hawaii because they won't wanna be here when all this stuff happens. And there's gonna be a lot of people that wanna to come to Hawaii because they wanna be remote when this stuff happens. And I don't know when this is gonna happen. Um, it's gonna happen the next 20 years. And so start thinking as young people who in 20 years are going to be the leaders of this place, what do you want it to look like? Those Waikiki hotels are going to be empty in 20 years. Maybe not, highly likely to be. Um, and maybe in 30 years, or I don't know when, but at some point the little puddle jumpers that go from island to island are going to be only available to the military and the very rich. So how do we construct a lifetime, a, a lifestyle based on different rules? And I'm not entirely certain about this, but if you read the tea leaves of how things come together, it's, it's a reasonable uh, prediction to make. Okay, another thing is technology is so wonderful, but most technology just creates little gadgets. We should have young engineering types create cross-generational technology as a suggestion. When everyone hears about end of growth and uh, currency or financial crisis, a lot of people's initial reaction is, well, I'm gonna buy gold, well, I'm gonna buy some guns. And you know that makes sense as an initial reaction, but I think better is to say, if all this stuff happens and I'm living in Hilo, what's the one skill or what's my personality type that I could contribute to this community? And if there's a lot of people, like 90%, that start doing those conversations and those things, You've already, circum you've already accessed the ultra-social part of our gene instead of letting it splinter into these other uh, negative things. So I mean, that's a suggestion. Okay, so that's like on the economy. How do you think about these things? These things are very difficult to assimilate. I don't know what the future is going to be. I think business as usual, continued growth is not very likely. I think kind of muddling through and the government taking over more and more things and guaranteeing things and guaranteeing the financial markets is pretty likely. I, I view the world every day as a probability distribution and I adjust my predictions based on new events. I don't know what's gonna happen. I think there's a spectrum of possibilities and there's a lot of quite good possibilities still available, but people need to wake up. So when we think about such a distribution, and when you hear a lecture like mine, especially if you haven't heard it before, naturally you expand in your brain the possibility of the super dark stuff, the Mad Max future, or this guy's totally delusional and we're going to have a Star Trek future. And we, we tend to overestimate both the positives and the negatives when the reality is there's a lot of stuff that's going to be in between, like here. So number one, expand your capacity for uncertainty and changing probabilities. The future likely has quite a bit of speed bumps, but is not yet determined. Uh, again, I didn't really have time to get into the reasons for this, but I would highly recommend just from a mental health standpoint to go on internet, social media, and even possibly electricity holidays. Because when we constantly have that Facebook and Twitter and Vine and ooh, how many likes did I get? It just hijacks our brain from being productive and growing tomatoes or bananas or sitting on a beach and constructing a poem and you young people have been hijacked more than any other generation. I'm totally screwed. I'm really addicted to the internet already, so it's too late for me. 
but you're young enough that it hasn't really gotten to that point yet, I assume. Um, try to narrow the gap between virtual and real worlds, um, which requires education and silence, out thinking with no other humans and thinking about things and looking at nature and just processing ecology and biology and natural science and just thinking without having, one human trait is, is very bad, is we look around us for social cues to see if other people are reacting. And if they're not reacting, we don't react. There was a study where there was five people in a room and there was smoke coming under the door. And if the other four people didn't say anything about the smoke, the fifth person who was the test subject, they didn't say anything either. So we really care about what other people say. So um, anyways, I'm gonna move on. Okay, lean into your fear. So I hired a neuro-linguistic programmer when I was um, afraid to risk my money for my clients on Wall Street. I was able to risk my own money, but I felt like if I lost for them, I would... Anyways, I hired this guy and he said, you need to, if you're afraid of something, you need to go towards it. The natural tendency is to go away from it. So I did a trial and I was really afraid of spiders and within two weeks I was able to actually pet a wolf spider in North Carolina and I got over that. Um, but then I found the book Limits to Growth and I started learning about energy and I gave all my clients their money back anyways. But my point here is that if you're afraid of something to lean into it uh, and it might give you some, some interesting results. Um, so these things that shout louder to us, we can, I'm not sure that we have free will per se, another discussion, but we can practice free won't. You can say, I'm going to do this on next Tuesday, and you make a social contract with yourself. And there's lots of examples uh, of that where you can make these things shout louder um, than they normally would. And the way to do that is to build neural structures for when tomorrow becomes today. Uh, I'm gonna keep going. And the other thing is, even if you dedicate your life to um, engaging in these issues, you have to do it a third or a half time. And the other half time, you need to play with dogs and play with babies and go on beach hikes and, and just live. Because this stuff, this is not what we evolved to talk about and engage in. It's really kind of toxic stuff if you do it all the time. I hope you do engage in it, but leave time for the, the fun things in life as well. Another thing is, when things bad happen, naturally, we blame others. That's a deep, deep evolutionary drive. Um, it's the Republicans, it's the Democrats, it's the Muslims, it's the tree huggers, it's the Chinese, it's the rich. Well, the truth is, it's that our fossil slaves are asking for pay raises. And it's really nobody's fault. There's some bad people, and there's a lot of good people. And we're kind of all in this together. And, and what ends up happening is, I know some people that just hate Obama. Every bad thing in the world is because of Obama. And it, I realized maybe some of the things they said were true, but it really was an escape for them to take responsibility for anything going on in their world. So I would recommend to you to avoid blame as much as possible and take ownership and responsibility. And number nine is reject the consensus trance. Tomorrow there's a billion, 400 million Powerball. This guy was on Fox News this morning. Tips to increase, buy as many tickets as you can afford. I just thought that. <laughs> as an example of the consensus trance. Avoid like doing what everyone else is saying. Uh, okay, the environment. The environment. Um, don't just tweet, do. When Uncle Tom's Cabin came out in the mid uh, 1800s, people were outraged. They were rioting in the streets. Now when something happens, you go, know, God dang it, I'm gonna write a blog post about that. Oh, I feel much better. And our little angst has been diffused because we wrote some characters and sent it out to the ether, assuming that the wise other people and humans are gonna say, well, look at that, let's do that. But we've stopped doing, and I think we're gonna have to change that. Um, again, I don't think socially shaming is the right way to go. Oh, you flew too many times last year, or you eat a lot of meat, shame on you, the climate change. I think reducing consumption is fine, living in a shack out in the woods, but the truth is at the stage we're at now, living in a shack out in the woods is doing about the same as someone who's working at Exxon. So I think we need more warriors and mystics that inspire, lead by example, and engage with, with what's happening. We also need a lot more diplomats between energy and the economy. 
um, I'm sorry, between the environment and the economy. Because there's a lot of, uh, I made these in a hurry today. There's a lot of people that are just shrill on climate change. And I, I kind of agree with them. I think it's a major issue. But there's a lot of people that are busy working on our wastewater treatment plants and the electricity that gets to your houses. And these people are not talking to each other. Um, so we need facilitators, young educated systems thinkers. Um, Homo sapiens isn't here yet. I would recommend strengthening the agenda of the sapient mind versus the agenda of the gene. That's kind of an advanced suggestion, but I'll just throw it in there. Solar panels, renewables. I, think, I advocate renewable energy, but use renewable energy, but not to build a bigger heat engine. So if we look at this graph like it was on that Engelhard world value that you get declining returns to more, it's the same thing with renewable energy. One watt will charge your cell phone, 10 watts your computer, Think of what you could do with your first 100 watts. Here's a solar oven I have that I don't even need to turn my oven on and it cooks my food. Now, do we really need to bake two turkeys at two in the morning because we can't sleep? You know, so I, I, I think all this stuff in your lifetime might go away. Um, no, we might have community, uh, I, I digress. My point is I'm pro renewable energy, but I'm also a realist on what it can accomplish. The real stock market has been crashing since I was born. And we talked about the details there. This is my writing partner, one of the early people at Greenpeace. He lives on Oahu. We're writing a book to hopefully inspire young people on this stuff. This is him swimming with a dolphin that was one of his best friends. And you may sound, that may sound silly. But there's so much about these creatures in the ocean Dolphins and, I sh dolphins and humans share a common ancestor 70 million years ago. Their brains are as big and as complex as ours. Unbelievable stories about how empathic they are and how they care and how they know things. There are 250 to 300 year old bow um, head whales in the, in the uh, Arctic. And we know that because we found one that had a harpoon point in it that from the 1700s. We don't even know what this life is in our own ocean and we're trying to, Elon Musk last week said that he hopes he dies on Mars, hopefully not on impact. I mean, they're seriously thinking about terraforming Mars when we don't even know our own Earth yet. So I, I think to, to stand for this is, is important. Uh, in pursuing fairness and justice, which we are very good at doing, please don't forget our cousins, nephews, and nieces that we share the planet with. Uh, number six, educate and inspire others on new aspirations and values and speak up and speak out when you see an injustice, whether it's a dog mistreated or something that you know is wrong, don't just toe the common line. And I think we need to welcome and consider alien thinking. There's too many of us that think the same way and we need new ways of, of uh, you know, getting fresh ideas and that you know, might fall to you a lot of this. Okay, so in conclusion, I've talked for over an hour. I've given three lenses with which to view the world. And there are three narratives that I've told you that are very inconsistent with what you're hearing on the media and elsewhere. Number one, this is probably the most understood and agreed with, is that humans are power enough to cause a sixth mass extinction. And this is without climate change. It's happening now. Number two is that energy underpins nature and human societies and its increasing cost is not going to allow future economic growth for much longer. And number three is human behavior was formed in the crucible of our ancestral past and carries with us uh, in our everyday interactions. So um, conclusion, energy is what we have to budget and spend. Money is just who controls the energy. Peak oil should have probably been called peak benefits around 10 years ago. For most in the US, Japan, and Europe, growth is already over. We're hitting social limits to growth before hard resource limits to growth. Uh, skip number three, I already said that. Uh, environmental scientists and activists will probably be working under a smaller surplus conditions, possible dislocations and rule changes. The fossil carbon pulse has been a giant monkey trap set before we even evolved, and we need to be thinking about and preparing for life after fossil fuels. Remember that whether you agree with what I've said tonight or not, fossil fuels are going away this century. 2100, there won't be many left. So. If we give them up earlier, we can save a world. It's not like the choice is let's do it for 500 years more. 
Number six, the market will not solve it, but keep digging our holes deeper. Number seven is what young people value and stand up for is one of our highest leverage points, my opinion. So I really have no answers on these things. I've kind of drawn a line in the sand and, and said, this is how I see the future. And these things are likely to happen, but if we work and educate and, and inspire some better things, better outcomes can happen. I think me admitting that I have no answers personally is two or three steps ahead of most people who do have answers. Uh, because they're looking in a reductionist silo type of thing and not how everything fits together. So this is the carbon pulse I was just talking about. Are we here? Are we here? I don't know. We're a social species overly focused on the next five or ten years. So to you young people, it's kind of like Lord of the Rings when Frodo says, I wish the ring had never come to me. I wish none of this had happened. Gandalf says, so do all who live to see such times. That's not for us to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time it has given us. The United States could lead by example. It's not really global population or global consumption that's the huge problem. The huge problem is that the rich countries are marketing to India and China what they should aspire to. And we could conceivably lead by example. And I don't know what to do, and I think we, there, we need to try a million things because we'll never know which of those in retrospect will have had the most impact. Um, and there's been a lot of famous people who are, were the architects of, of history and it's still unknown what this century is going to bring. My final advice to you is this is really heavy stuff. And I think you first have to like yourself and come up with uh, a self definition of what you stand for and be happy with yourself. What do I stand for? Well, I think I'm an educator of the unity of knowledge. I like to think that I'm kind, especially to animals and to young people. I consider myself a citizen of a full planet, and I care about deep time coexistence with humans and other large complex life. This is how I define myself. And I think you're 19, 20 years old. To figure out what you stand for facing these challenges is the first step because it will empower you to do a lot of other things and feel better about it. Uh, Hawaii's future is not yet determined. There's lots of different trajectories it could go. And I, I invite you to um, get involved, educate and imagine, change the goal and stay in the game. Thank you very much.